Hello everyone, uh, welcome to a SIEM webinar on better online meetings. This webinar will be presented by Diana Pound and Ross Freeman from Dialogue Matters. Before I hand over to them both to present the webinar, I would just like to say that we'll, they'll be doing a Q&A halfway through and at the end of the webinar. Uh, so to ask your questions for this, there should be a Q&A button either at the top or the bottom of your screen. If you click on this and then type in your question and press send, then we can see see your questions come through. And like I said, there'll be be two two Q and A sessions for you to ask your questions. Okay, so without further ado, I will now hand over to Diana and Ross. Thank you both. Thank you. Okay, so could I first ask Ross, you're listening into this. Can you just tell me, am I showing the right screen? You are. Excellent. We're good. That is good news. Okay, well, <clears throat> hello to everybody who's dialed into this. Um, I hope that over this next hour, we can give you some really useful hints and tips about better online meetings. It's fair to say that we're going to come at this from probably quite a different perspective to many of the perspectives you can see as a lot of online guidance and meeting suggestions that are of course now whooshing around the internet but um, we're coming to this as professional facilitators who Dialogue Matters itself has existed for 20 years and we are very experienced at facilitating face-to-face -face, uh, negotiations, consensus building, exchange of knowledge in a research context and we've been doing that for 20 years and now we've been um, innovating since, uh, sorry, since I saw where we are now coming um, late January. And at that point we started innovating about how do we take all our best practices online? So I'm just going to um, go first of all to, to talk to you a little bit about what's actually motivating us at this time. So I know there's people on this webinar who are not from a natural environment background, but most of Saeem people who've joined probably are. And so we are really, really concerned about the loss of momentum um, to address the nature and climate crisis. And we're perceiving that as many environmentalists do as the, that what is coming down the track to us will make what the world is going through now look actually quite, quite a small thing, which sounds an astonishing claim to make. But if we don't avert the climate and nature crisis and the trajectory that we were on up until now, then we you know future generations are facing something much much worse so this was meant to be the environment super year and i was going to all sorts of national and international events around that and lots of our contracts were part of that and now all of that is frozen or postponed or in shock or whatever state it's in so we resolved that we want to play our part to help maintain progress on the nature and climate um sort of dialogues discussions and action hard to transition projects we currently got to online dialogue and an example of that is that we just agreed yesterday with Bayes that we are going to take uh, an international um, workshop that was meant to be in Oxford face to face and it's bringing together global experts on the physical impacts of climate change with global experts on the economic models around climate change to make sure those economic models actually start delivering something bit more realistic and that has now just been agreed that that all goes to a week-long online deliberative event which is obviously hugely exciting and quite a challenge at the same time we're also passionate about trying to use this opportunity to sort of seize this awful moment but and start catalyzing community conversations for find a greener world and um we're speaking to some funders about that and that so far they're interested but nobody's bitten so if anybody knows some big funders who might like to help us get something like that online and rolled out nationally that would be fantastic get in touch um and we want to be at the cutting edge of best practice because we always have face to face and we want to be there now in this online space and based on the facilitated uh, workshops that i've been to over the last three or four weeks as facilitation world is trying to grapple with this new challenge we already are on the leading edge of best practice so that's that's encouraging and obviously what part what motivates is that we want to keep going because we believe we do great work and we want to be able to keep doing that so a little bit about what we do we design facilitate train and advise and research into best practice 
stakeholder participation, dialogue, negotiation, knowledge exchange. We work at all scales, so we've done very local place-based work, better management of a forest or an area of sea or something like that. And then I've just mentioned the global example. We work all over the place, so 28 countries so far, and I think the furthest east is India, the furthest west is either Guyana in South America or the Turks and Caicos Islands. I'm not sure which is further west, but anyway, that way. And then furthest north is Norway and further south is South Africa. And we've also worked in Central Asia, lots of different European countries. And we've done one project in um, the Middle East, which is about the future of the Red Sea. So we've worked all over the place, trained all over the place and on the full range of environmental topics. So land, sea, rivers, climate, farming, food security and, and a curious variety of research um, projects as well. So that's sort of our sphere and what we do. So when we come to any kind of engagement between people that is about dialogue and communication, we, we want to work, you know, what's working? What, what, how could that be improved? And of course, we're, we're asking ourselves that question continuously now in this online space. So the contents of this are going to be a, a bit of an introduction to some concepts that inform our thinking. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between task thinking and group thinking and our group health thinking. I'll explain that in a moment. Then we're going to go through what you need to think about before. So things, sort of technical things, and Ross is going to pick up on that, on the technical things and guidance to the people involved. And I'm going to pick up a little bit on planning meetings, which most of us don't really plan even day-to-day face-to-face meetings. So the idea of planning and the benefit of doing that is maybe a new idea for some people. And then during, so uh, what, 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 what you need to set up for success in your meeting, and then some of the people dynamics and how you can be more inclusive. And then we just got a couple of slides for after and the final questions. So the focus of this is to be clear, because I've introduced some of what we do. So this is the focus on online meetings that the, you people who are listening in can do with your larger teams or project partners or external people who you would have normal meetings. You wouldn't need to get in a proper facilitator doing all the design and, and all of that sort of stuff that is our normal day job. That This is the kind of meetings you've been having up until this point face-to-face -face with large groups of people. Now, some of this, of course, also is useful for you and your teams if they're smaller teams, but of course, they will be, you will be much more informal and you won't need to plan on structure and design. But there's some, still some, I hope, hints and tips for working more effectively, even at a small team scale with how to include quieter voices and things like that. So then the tech side and the people side, but not the complex multi-stakeholder workshops, collaboration and consensus building. We're not covering that today. So there's two key components of great meetings that, as we see it, and this is why I think this might be a bit of a bit different presentation you might get anywhere else on the web at the moment. And we see it like this. So there's, um, it's the tip of the iceberg is the task and everybody gets very focused on the task. Why are you having a meeting? What needs to be achieved? And everybody can get very focused on achieving that task and focusing on that task. But supporting all of that is the group health, the dynamic, the way people work together as they explore and think about that task. And what can happen is everybody can get so very task focused that there is no attention being given to this group health aspect. So what do we mean by that? Um, so this is group health for collaborative working. So it, it's about building good social capital and that's a bit of a social science techie term, but it's, it's, it's about trust. It's about the glue that helps groups come together and work effectively together. So it's about building trust, goodwill, having a bit of fun, um, reciprocity. So that's about your exchanging knowledge or um, action of some sort or goods or services. You're building up some collaborative endeavor and working um, to support each other in achieving it. And then common rules and norms. And those are, those are things that you agree about how you conduct yourself and how you uh, behave towards other people. And that can be within a meeting or beyond the meeting in, in how you work collaboratively um, outside of actual meetings. But you, you want to be thinking about how are those things built in the meetings that you, you have. There needs to be a good Greek feel. So that's about people feeling like they belong, they're welcome. Um, over time, if you're meeting with the same group, that they start feeling some affiliation to that group, building some sort of shared identity and purpose, and, and there being friendly and positive relationships between people. 
then that people individually are feeling that their psychological needs are met. So they're feeling respected, they're feeling valued and appreciated, they're feeling listened to, like they've got an opportunity to contribute their thoughts and that's valued and welcomed. And they have some sense of agency in a meeting, so they feel able that they can, they're able to make a difference and contribute. And then if you're attending to those things as well as the task, then you will have much, much more <clears throat> productive meetings. And of course, that applies whether or not you're meeting face to face or online. But we think that in an online context that maybe even more attention needs to be given to these things because we we're missing out on some of the cues we give each other in terms of body language or um, slight you know very subtly nuanced facial expressions are, are kind of muted or even lost in in the online space so now we're going to do what you need to do um, some of the techie things to think about um, it, as you start your meeting so this is the the before there's a block of stuff about before and a block of stuff about during and then after so i'm just going to hand over now to ross who's going to talk about the tech side of online meetings thanks diana can you hear me okay i can hear you i don't know about anybody good. else <laughs> well if you can hear me i think we're off to a good start <laughs> okay um can you go to the next slide please yeah sure so i think just very briefly, um, to give you an overview, there isn't a huge choice of communication platforms available to us at the moment. I know many of us are going to be guided by our organisation's preference or even industry best practice or chosen platforms. So um, one thing that is almost certain is that as a meeting host, we're going to be able to choose from at least two or three different platform Kate on if not from the whole market so it's it's really important to reflect on what you need and want to get from your meetings online and then think about how those platforms can help you deliver it so just as a simple overview are they going to be small meetings are they going to be large meetings with discussions going on where you need to break people into smaller groups um, what kind of technical requirements are you going to need in terms of software and hardware? And, and does everybody have that kind of thing at home? Um, and which kind of tools would help you run a meeting effectively? So it can be simple things like being able to note on the screen and show people what's going on, or it can be more complex functions like breaking people out into groups. Um, next slide, please. Um, as a host, it's incredibly important to get yourself set up well. I think it helps with the confidence and the comfort um, and it gives you one less thing to worry about really when you're trying to get some good outcomes. Um, so it is important to have reliable microphones, speaker or headphones and a webcam. You know, they become not just your interface with the computer, but it is absolutely your means of capturing your expressions and words and ensuring that you communicate effectively with the other people in the meeting. Um, we would always say check your equipment in advance, make sure your connections are working well and have a really good think about how you can handle issues that can come up. You know, with the best will in the world, things will still go wrong from time to time and what will you do to resolve that so if the connection's poor how can you provide information to the people you know would you perhaps have a backup session planned at some point or sharing word documents or google documents in another format next slide please so i think once you've chosen your platform it's really important to get familiar with it you know at the end of the day these are tools um, have some fun at every opportunity and find out what works and what doesn't work. You can see the Dialogue Matters team there having a meeting last week. We were inspired by um, a lady who was running a meeting in the States, I think it was a potato. So uh, Diana took on the guise of an onion and in that particular image on the banana. So have some fun, make it friendly and enjoyable whenever you can practice and explore all different functions you've got on your platform. If you really want to get into it or you're stuck for things, then check out the, the tutorials that are available online, both 
on the different platforms, sites themselves, but also things like YouTube, um, and ask them questions, ask the support questions if you need to. Basically, the more you can build online communication tools into your day and day-to-day -day work, the easier it's going to be when it comes to using it fluently to meet and get people to decide and, and move things forward. So just practice, explore, and find fun ways of using it day to day. You're one step ahead of me, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think as a host, it's really important to put yourself into your participants' shoes. Um, we're all going to be facing different contexts. Um, most of us, where we can, we're working from home. We're going to have different setups. We're going to you know, the ease of being able to book a meeting room and pull up a chair has kind of evaporated for the time being. So I think whatever thought you can give, however many times you can put yourself in your participant's shoes when it comes to thinking about how they're going to experience the meeting, the better. So, for example, do people have headphones and microphones, web cameras, desktop and laptops? Those are the kind of things that you're probably going to want to set as a minimum if you need interaction, if you need to share presentations, if you need to share documents. But it's important to factor in the different kind of kit that people will have available to them. So some people will join from mobile devices, whether that's tablets or phones. They can certainly be used, but they will change the view that that person has of your material and your meeting. Um, speakers, you see mic can work just fine, but if you're set up on a kitchen table at home, it can mean that sometimes the quality of what's being received or delivered in a meeting space can be um, constrained somewhat. Uh, we've certainly found that for the best results, headphones or um, earbuds with a microphone attachment just allow us to really immerse ourselves in the meeting space and focus on what's going on. And go to the next slide, please. And the next one. So now we're gonna move on to guiding. So as a host, this is very much about giving some guidance to your meeting participants. Really giving them advice, you know, upfront, telling them the platform that you've chosen to use, finding out if they're familiar with it, letting them know how to create an account and how to join the meeting, just making it as simple as possible to, to engage in the meeting space online. Um, provide them with some basic information about the screen, what it looks like. There's Diana, you can see. Um, this is a Zoom screenshot, so the different kind of um, buttons that are available to the participant. Um, and it is worth just kind of flagging at this point that sometimes the participant and host will have different views of those buttons or different views of the screen. Um, importantly, particularly as the size of your meetings, you know, the number of participants that you're involved in grows, is to use the mute button and share with the participants how they should mute. So next slide, please. Um, We've all had experience in recent weeks, no doubt, of um, going online and meeting online and the kind of funny things that have happened in, that have been shared in the media or on social media, people turning up as potatoes and not being able to turn themselves off or people not knowing that they've got their webcam on and walking around with uh, not a lot on. So I think it's always worth just kind of making it clear to participants in advance what what's expected really so make sure you, you've got appropriate clothing um checking what's behind them if possible if they can getting into a separate room from other people maybe in the house um watching out on the lighting um it's quite easy to end up with a window behind you or a doorway and you then become a bit of a silhouette and i think when it comes to actually interacting and discussing um, actively in meetings, it's important to be able to see people's faces as much as possible. We, we try and use webcam at every opportunity. Um, it becomes the key means of seeing people's expressions and faces and, and levels of engagement. 
um, I think it's also really important to, you know, we found ourselves, I joined a webinar the other day um, and the lady was saying, you know, we've all got new co-workers at the moment. I think it's really important to realise that many people um, who will be joining meetings or hosting meetings, you know, we've got new co-workers around. So home workers uh, with outside partners or other people we live with and people potentially schooling or studying from home as well. So share your schedule with them, try and minimise the amount of interruption and, and maximise the amount of bandwidth that you've got available. Next slide, please. Um, it's really important, not only as a host, but also to advise your participants to make themselves comfortable as possible. Um, you know, are they comfortable temperature-wise? Home offices can tend to be a bit cold. My feet certainly get colder when I'm sat down at home at the table all day for some reason. So woolly socks or woolly jumpers if you need them or open a window if possible and it's not too loud to keep cool. Um, make sure there's water and snacks to hand and that they've got a, a, the agenda in advance and um, they can print it out. This is particularly important if um, they've got one screen, if it's a smaller laptop screen. Um, try and make it as easy as possible to access the material and be comfortable around it. Uh, and finally, I think something that can help um, is to ensure that the name on the screen is their name. We've, we recently did some training with the university and uh, the default names on the screens were basically numbers because that was how the email accounts were set up. So we had to make sure in advance that people were aware of that and then adjusted those on the day of the meeting. It makes it really hard to interact with people if you, if you don't know their name. Uh, next slide, please. I think something we've found um, is because of the lack of body signals, body language on an online meeting, it's really important to set out some protocols about how we communicate with each other. Um, generally speaking, if there's a presentation happening, then the participants will be muted. Um, if there's discussion and input is required, then obviously unmuting. But I think indicating how you want to speak, not everyone's gonna have a webcam. So hand raising is possible if you've got a webcam in front of the camera or using the virtual hand signals where those exist on your communication platform. Um, chat is an absolute you know, brilliant place to put questions and comments uh, during presentations that can then be picked up on afterwards. Um, there are many other signals available which can be used um, if you've got webcams, things like putting your arms across your body if you disagree with things. Check those out if you think those are gonna be of use to you. And um, the next slide, please. So we always work on the basis that people are not going to be super familiar with the tech that's um, available to them or the platform. We all have experience of different platforms. We all have different experience of joining meetings. So whenever we set a training session up or a meeting, we'll have a tech check, as we call it, the day before, ideally. So we invite people in um, just to let them check, you know, it helps us as well, but to let them check that their link's working in the email. If it's not, then there's time to flag that kind of thing up to make sure that the microphone and the speakers are working correctly. Sometimes computers just randomly will change your settings and you won't be able to communicate very well. Um, so that's, I think, important the day before. On the actual day of a meeting, try and open up 15 or so minutes before the meeting's due to start just to allow for minor glitches, whether that's at the host end or participants joining in. Things can go wrong and they do go wrong. So it's really important to prepare, think about what the backups could be and have those in place so that if it does go wrong, you can then move on and continue meeting or getting your um, points across. Next slide, please, and back over to you, Diana. Thanks, Ross. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about planning and structuring meetings. So obviously, if this is a team meeting, you can be informal, you can go off track. None of that matters. So if it's just you, so in our Dialogue Matters team meetings, it's just myself and the team of four normally, um, the core team, and th this level of formality is not required. But if you are meeting externally with multiple others, um, whether they're from or internally with a large project group, then um, giving some attention to how you structure your meetings, keep focus, change pace, and so on, actually will make a real difference to the productivity of the meeting. So um, plan to do those things. How will you keep focus? How will you change pace? Uh, if the, the platform enables it, you know, are there times when everybody can be in plenary and then sometimes they can be in breakouts where they can do group work in smaller groups and then feedback their thinking? Factor in lots of breaks. So when you're planning, you're structuring your event, think about lots of breaks. Um, in longer meetings, we think that you need to break every hour. And we, we're talking, we, we're designing in what we call quick shakedowns, which is sort of a two or three minutes get up stretch. Um, and then we have slightly longer tea coffee breaks. And then we have 30 minute lunch breaks. We don't have the full hour because there's not the networking opportunity. But and in any case, we're spreading break times around other parts of the day. So um, lunch is, is a 30 minute break. Um, and think about how you might plan to hand over to others to host or lead a discussion because that creates a slightly different dynamic. It's a different voice and, it, and it's a different face if you've got video and then that's altogether more engaging. Think about inclusivity. So um, to our shock, actually, when we were trying to look into this and see what advice there was about inclusivity for um, online meetings, actually, there's very, very little out there that we could find easily. Um, so we did quite a lot of um, rummaging around and we've uh, on our own thinking and here are some of the things we've come up with. So first of all, ask. So if you're meeting with people you don't no, um, you would do this in a larger face to face meeting. You know, is there any special requirements we need to factor in here to help and support you? So ask. If you're doing presentations, use large, clear font. If you are again using visuals, avoid putting reds and greens together. If uh, you know there's people who are hard of hearing, then think about speaking much more slowly and clearly and obviously testing your mic and sound beforehand and avoid spending too long actually at the computer so a lot of people um, would have back issues or some physical challenge to sitting for long periods of time at their computer and likewise some people who are neurodiverse people would find quite it quite difficult to even be staring at computer screens for any prolonged amount of time because of the blue light and so on so so think about who you're involving and including and being inclusive in your meeting. And now I'm going to actually introduce something which works perfectly well in face to face, but we think is probably even more, more important line because of maybe the time constraints to long meetings. Um, people's tolerance for that is not so good. So this is um, takes comes from Edward de Bono's Six Thinking Hats. And so I'm going to explore that a little bit in a moment about what that means and what that looks like in a meeting. But it is a way of structuring your meeting by questions, not topics. And that has quite a number of benefits. So it increases efficiency. And the De Bono thinking systems claim that it can increase the efficiency of meetings by up to 10 times, which is if you know how to use this tool and that's uh, or this, think this, this method, then that's a quite a profound saving in time. It helps people concentrate their thinking and their responses. Uh, it, as I've already said, this is a good approach for offline meetings too. Um, and it can reduce tension between, between individuals if there's disagreement and quiet voices get a chance to contribute. So there's lots of benefits for doing this. But what, how does it actually work? So this is uh, at, the, at the core of it, there's these six hats, six different ways of thinking. So this is absolutely not about categorizing individuals. This, this is that we should all be good at being able to use all these hats to consider proposals or to plan action or to review progress. But they, they go like this. So the white hat is, about neutral, is, is a neutral hat. It's about facts and figures, what information you've got, what information you need. Um, love, much beloved of scientists because of course it's all about data and needing lots more data. So um, that's white hat. Red hat is how you feel about things. And, and when you're using these methods, um, I've been trained to use these methods as a professional de bono facilitator and uh, the red hat is you, you're not asking anybody 
to justify why they feel something. So if they say, look, my gut reaction is this is just not a good idea, or my intuition tells me we should really go for this. Um, because there's other ways of picking out what is the rationale between that. And if that, and, and we, we underestimate the value of intuition and gut reactions in um, the way we think about change and plan action. So black hat is troubleshooting, what the problems, issues, difficulties, what can go wrong. Yellow hat is all the positives and optimistic stuff. So it will work, what are the benefits, who will benefit, how will they experience those benefits. Green hat is about creativity. So alternatives, differences, new ideas, that's the lateral thinking hat. And blue hat is, is thinking about the process by which you do things, the way you order subjects, organize things in step-by-step -step processes and progress. So it's, and uh, when it comes to the six hats, the blue hat is the way of thinking about what audio do you use the different hats in for different purposes. So another reason for using these hats is actually, if you start looking at the basis of most decisions that are made, and this is face-to-face -face or online, that it's actually pretty random. And we're very unaware of that when we're in meetings. But you've got the different hats uh, considering a perspective. So there's something that needs to change or to be discussed or talked about. And people are coming at it from very different perspectives. But then along with that is a whole bunch of different behaviours. And of course, um, there's far more than just the sort of, uh, five I've identified there. And then there's also different power bases. And what you could get is that you could put a proposal up. And if somebody was using their black hat thinking and being very dominant and using, let's say, money, um, then you wouldn't do it for financial reasons. And if somebody was wearing their yellow hat and being quite assertive and they were using science, then you might do something for scientific reasons. So this combination of the perspective somebody is, is using, the behavior that they either naturally have or that they choose to use in meetings to um, really push their view forward and the kind of power they invoke to enable them to do that are actually, if you actually start unpicking what happens in normal meetings, it's some combination of that. And that's not about, is this actually the best solution on merit or is this the most important priority to address at this time? So, you shift from this thinking where everybody is using different hats and taking different perspectives at the same time on some shared challenge and you shift to parallel working. So the diagram this on the left, that's sort of like everybody's coming at the challenge from different perspectives. And we tend, um, I don't know if this is a typically Western mindset thing. Uh, I suspect it probably is, but we induce oppositional thinking. So if I say something's a really bad idea, it will probably induce you to think of why it's a really good idea. If, I, if I'm using information, you might want to start thinking all sorts of uh, intuitive the feelings or lateral thinking or something. So we, we induce behavior that actually creates up oppositions. And that's partly going back to our heritage that one argument set up against another is how you get to truth. So it's very embedded in our culture, our psychology, the way we conduct ourselves. But so if you can unpick that and start asking people questions where they all are thinking about the same response at the same time. So to illustrate that, I'm just going to give you this example. So suppose there's a proposal. And if you just say to people, what do you think of this proposal? Then the chances are you will induce that model of some people thinking positively, negatively about what information they need to consider the proposal. They've got instinct about the proposal and that will all be going on in the same space at the same time. So instead of that, structure the questions. So we've got a proposal. What are the positives of this proposal? And you list up the responses. What are the challenges of this proposal? Any new ideas or solutions to overcome the challenges and enhance the positives? Any different ways we could achieve the same outcome? How do we move forward on this? Who's going to do what and when to make it happen? And if you give five to ten minutes max to each of those questions, you will save enormous efficiencies in how you need to uh, into getting to decisions and getting to outcomes and it will be much better thought through and also then you're getting to things that are uh, considered on merit not on that serendipity of whose behavior which hat and which power at what moment and then if you're doing bigger meetings team meetings then um we so we've talked about structuring meetings but if you're doing something much bigger so some of this advice came out some advice i gave to the ceos of some of the wildlife trusts about three weeks ago when they were heading into huge team meetings with about 70 of their team to talk about how they adjusted to this new um context and many of them had never used any of these platforms before so if you're if you are going to that kind of scale we suggest you need a main host a support person a note taker and a timekeeper 
um, and maybe an additional person who's looking at the questions and checking the questions and comments like, like you'll be doing now in chat. So we've now got maybe five or ten minutes for questions before we move on to the second part of the presentation. Okay, we've got um, two questions that have been posted. Um, one from Emma McDonald asking if we find Zoom to be reliable. Is it a reliable platform? Yes, we found it reliable. Um, it's not without its occasional glitches and question marks, but um, we found it to be reliable for what we've used it for. Um, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that, Diana. Yeah, I think it's worth saying that um, back in January when we saw what, where, what, where we all are now, poss a possibility on the horizon, we did quite a lot of homework about what platforms enable quite um, some of our more advanced facilitation approaches, so breakouts and plenaries and use of different platforms integrated with um, the video part. And um, Zoom is definitely the, the tool of choice for facilitators, and that's internationally, because I've been part of quite a few international discussions about adapting to this new context. So Zoom is definitely the platform of choice for facilitators, but I can't comment on the others because I'm unfamiliar with them and I don't know. <laughs> I do understand that, that Zoom uh, demands less bandwidth, which when we've got multiple people in a house working, that obviously is also an additional benefit. Yeah, um, Nick Sibbert has also asked what the relative merits of Zoom and Microsoft Teams are. I think it, it does come down to what, what you're going to be using it for. Um, as Diana said, Zoom's got some functionality which we find really useful in the kind of work we do, being able to have breakouts and take notes and all that kind of thing. Um, but it's not, and perhaps not perfect for your own context. Uh, Microsoft Teams has the advantage, obviously, you can you can build the team um, not only communicating online, but also then sharing documents and files and all those kind of things around it. So that could be something that's of value to you. Um, that's not to say it can't be done on other platforms, just with a bit more creativity. Um, then we've got a question from Tom Hunt, and he's he's been told that he, he's arranging a meeting next week and he's been told that because it's online he won't need as much time or he won't need all that time. His gut instinct is that it's right uh, but he can't figure out why. Why do people think online meetings should be shorter than face-to-face -face ones? <laughs> so I guess my response to that would be that uh, it's actually about physical comfort um, and I think that, so this is not, uh, does the content of what needs to be covered. So we talked, I talked at the beginning about task and the sort of group, uh, the, the sort of human side of meetings and being attentive to both of those things. Now the task might need to take you longer than uh, two to three hours, but actually to have people sat still at a computer without being able to get up and uh, move or move in the way you would do in face-to-face uh, -face meetings. Um, I, I think that's quite a big ask. I think we are pushing the tolerance levels that people have for meetings. I know somebody who works a lot with local governance and parish councils and trains people in parish councils, and he recently did um, a seven-hour meeting <laughs> with, with ordinary <laughs> citizens, which I think was really, really quite pushing the boundaries of, of what, it, what people can tolerate and cope with. Um, and they had to do it because, again, of the massive adjustments that have to be made at this time. But uh, I, uh, my gut instinct is that's too long. So I think there's a sort of a trade-off between what do you need to cover in your meeting, uh, if you like, the task and the, the human side of it and the being respectful to people and respectful of people's sort of physical needs and, uh, and focus and concentration. Um, and I guess our tolerance for all of this is going to grow and grow as, as this continued sort of shutdown continues. But um, yes, I think it's a trade-off between those two things. So I don't think it's inherently that the, that the meetings have, are quicker. I think we need to find ways to structure and design meetings so they are more effective at people's time, more engaging and, you know, the information I just shared. I also, to add to that, I think it's really important to consider the, the kind of group health side um, and have time for that and not just become way too task focused. <laughs> I think that's that's a risk as well. If, if you just see the meeting as a, a task issue, then yeah, you may be tempted to have a shorter one than if you're meeting in a room. 
um, to make time for the fun and the and the interaction as well. Uh, we've got quite a few more questions in, but I don't know if we've got too much more time for it, Diana. Should we? So I, I sensibly didn't note the uh, sarcastic. <laughs> I didn't actually <laughs> note when we got onto the questions. Bit. That's fair enough. So uh, we should, should probably we just take one or two more. Well, okay. Yeah. Well, I can see just looking at them quickly. Um, there's some very sort of specific techie questions. What I'll do is I will answer you directly in the Q and A at some point. Um, just to give you some general responses to that because it does vary from from uh, platform to platform what i would strongly suggest uh, is to check out the kind of if you go into zoom or you go onto microsoft teams or you look at skype or anything like that that uh, ask what kind of technical equipment they recommend because they they often have a kind of a, a minimum suggestion so that's the best place to look for that kind of thing rather than me trying to get into absolute detail um okay so shall we move on then yeah let's move on and then okay. I'll, I'll try and see if i can answer any more questions at some right. point. okay so i think right. it's back to me is it uh during yes getting started actually live in your meeting now absolutely so i think um have the agenda at hand make sure it's outlined um up front it's really about we think setting up solid foundations for the meeting so thinking about the kind of things we mentioned in the preparation phase the, before the meeting um, it's important to put everyone at ease about technology you know explicitly say we're not expecting any outages here but things can go wrong and if you've already got some contingency in place then you know so, make that clear at the outset as well so that people don't fret too much if they lose a connection or anything like that um, it's also the, the best place to remind people of the tech protocols that we mentioned before so muting raising hands or virtual hand raising actually i could see in the chat function to this webinar a couple of people have raised their virtual hands um, so if you do have if you have and you have got questions just pop them in the q a box please um, and also when comments would or discussions are available when to ask questions just make that really clear up front uh, the next slide please Diana. Um, introductions we often get a question mark about this and uh, Diana's said previously that when you're meeting with familiar people or your own team in small groups um, you may not need to, to do that every meeting but I think it's important to do it if you're meeting people uh, for the first time, or at least to give some idea to other participants of who is in the meeting. So for small groups, obviously ask people by name. If you've got a list or um, a tiled view of all the participants in your meeting in front of you as the host, then name the people and ask them to introduce themselves. Um, it's not possible to say next you'll end up having people you've probably come across this already talking over each other and not knowing who's next because different views give different um, orders to people if you've got bigger groups we feel it's best to introduce yourself and then outline uh, the other people that are there so which teams or sectors or interests are present in the meeting with you there's also suggestions as well that you can use the chat function uh, for group groups maybe in the sort of 20 to 40 size range where people can type in their own their name and what their background is or research topic or where they work that kind of thing just so that it's captured and people can then make connections if they want to um, icebreakers we feel particularly for the first meeting or if it's a project meeting with a different set of people in the room it's, it's important to have icebreakers um, in fact one of my colleagues picked up on some research earlier today and shared it with us that said well-placed icebreakers followed by some clear guidelines on how to work together before any discussions take place really help to set up a meeting that becomes much more balanced in terms of who's participating both the people who are naturally more dominant and those who would be quieter it also helps to give greater focus and encourages better listening amongst the group. Um, okay, next slide, please. 
So guidelines for working together, this works incredibly well when we're facilitating face-to-face -face, and it's also really important when you've got diverse groups of people that are not familiar with each other and how to, to effectively communicate and allow different voices in the room to, to get their points across or speak up. So it's important to, to underline this and make it explicit up front it's going to help to ensure that naturally more dominant voices again are balanced and that listening is more focused, but also sets very clear expectations, which as a host, you can draw on during a meeting at later points if you need to just calm things down at any, any time. So we always say one person is speaking at one time, please. This is even more important online. It's even trickier to control online because of delays and lags sometimes. Um, aim to stay focused. So, you know, don't go off and get distracted by emails, which is tricky sometimes when you're sat at a computer, your work computer, and they're pinging up in front of you. Raise questions and comments wherever you can. Stay on topic. Um, we always have a, a parking place or a rhubarb sack. We're trying to get away from the, the car connotations as much as we can, um, where we can park things which are potentially important to discuss, but not on either in the question that we're talking about at that point in time or the topic relevant and, and just make sure people have got their mobile phones off because they certainly are a distraction if they're on a desk in front of you. Next slide please. So introductory talks I think as a host or the chair or the, fa the facilitator of the meeting it's really important that you engage with the camera and even more so online because we don't have the benefit of all the, the other body language that we would normally pick up when we're sat in a room together. Um, so keep one-way presentations or briefings short. Be friendly. That is really engaging with the cameras if it's another person. Um, you can see Joel there in those pictures at the top looking at the camera and below looking at the screen or the person who he thinks he's talking to on the screen it does make a difference to have virtual eye contact. Um, try and separate off questions and comments in the chat box. Um, coming back to the friendly point, I think it's important, I should underline as well, that smiling comes across better. I mean, it's, it's the only form of expressing emotion that comes across on a telephone. Um, it's, it's important, just as important when you're talking online if you're looking at camera smiling more and as much as you possibly can just helps with the the uh, atmosphere and, and keeping things friendly um, if if you are taking notes or if someone else is taking notes or minutes uh, just make sure that they're muted as well because we've all experienced meetings where online meetings where people are typing away and it's it can be very distracting and very loud Next slide, and back to you, Diana. Okay, so the people side. Well, we've talked about um, staying focused on the task, so keeping on track, staying on time, and staying on topic. But this bit is really about the people side, so inviting responses and drawing out quieter voices. So um, if you've got a large group and you want them to engage, don't say, what do you think about this? Because first of all, online, you'll just get this, this silence and then two or three people will talk at the same time and it favours the dominant or assertive people. Don't also say, um, as I was on a, a big international thing last week and the host said, like, could everybody to the, my left please comment at this point? Because each screen will show people in a very different order. So who was to her left wasn't who I was seeing to the left of her on the screen. So you can't say, would those to my left want to contribute a thought at this point? Or let's start at the top and work left to right. Because if the layout is different, nobody knows who is at the top. Um, so that doesn't work. So what we found does work is to um, name three or th somewhere between three and five people. So you could say, you could look at your screen, you can see the names and you say, you don't want to put... Uh, people under enormous pressure to comment you want to create that space in which people feel they can comment but they're not under pressure to come up with some wise brilliant thought at that exact moment so you can just say to them 
you know, Gertrude, Sally and Bert, you know, have you got anything to contribute at this point? And then you name another three. And that's, that's cool. This opens the door psychologically if they've got a specific point they want to make or a specific question they want to ask. So um, that's about how to invite responses. Um, ways to include quieter people. So if you ask a, a question or there's an opportunity for everybody to be talking very freely, it is a dialogue happening at that point, different people are contributing different thoughts at different times. Just as in face-to-face, -face, you're going to get some people who are much more comfortable with that, much more assertive, much more confident in their own view, maybe just much more extrovert generally. And the quieter voices just won't, won't interject at that point. And then you're missing out on some of the knowledge and wisdom that are actually there available to the meeting, but are not getting a chance to contribute. So in face-to-face, -face, we would say something like, let's hear from somebody who hasn't spoken so far. And if you could then, you know, it depends how big your meeting is and how many small boxes of people you've got in front of you. But, you know, say it was 15 or 20, 25, and you knew that the three or four who'd not yet spoken, then you could again do the, well, let's hear from Jim, Sally and Gertrude again. So, so you know, any of you got a thought at this time, but at least make that space for people who are less forceful in the way they engage with others. So let's hear from somebody who hasn't spoken so far. Has anybody who's not spoken yet got something to add? We've only got two, three minutes left uh, on this topic. Any final thoughts from those who've not spoken? So those are the kind of questions that we would use live as facilitators and, and are doing so now online. Um, to manage tensions. Um, now, actually, my observation to date is that online people's are much more muted in their emotions. Now, whether that's because you can see your own self back on a camera in a little box or quite why that is, I don't know. And, and my intuition would tell me that this will begin to change and that the more assertive bullish characters or if there's something that, that provokes very different perspectives that, that gradually will get more relaxed to online working and then those behaviours will become more evident in online meetings as well. So if there is getting tension, then these would be our hints and tips as facilitators. So feedback, each person's concern without giving your own view on the topic note the concerns down, then feedback. So this is what I noted. Are you saying, and read it out, is that right? Have I got that right? And then you can say how that point will be dealt with. You can either say, okay, this is now so important. Let's host the meeting. I think maybe we need to give time to this. Or you can say, that is something we really need to note, but at the moment we're staying on track. So we'll just, we'll just note that and we'll put that to one side. That's what we would call our parking place or now rhubarb sack or maybe bike rack or I don't know, whatever we're going to call it. But anyway, we're putting that to one side and you need to be sure that's not a way of silencing perspectives. That is logging perspectives that are off topic, but you definitely need to undertake to come back to it. Otherwise it becomes uh, just a way of silencing views you don't want to hear. And that is obviously completely unacceptable. So, and then, um, so having done that, you've noted it, you've read it out to them, you've said how you're going to deal with it and then invite other contributions on that topic if that's the right thing to do or say we need to move back on now to our next topic and then end your meeting kindly so um, there's a real sort of social abruptness to the end of online meetings we're very used to face-to-face -face meetings which have these sort of soft endings when it might be that the formal meeting ends but then we all start up, stand up and we all have a bit of a chat and we find out you know what people did at the weekend or we we talk about other projects we might want to engage with and we walk out of the meeting together in part in twos or threes and we chat and we go out to the cars and then we go on away so the so normal face-to-face -face meetings have these very soft endings but online meetings don't suddenly bam the things ended and you're left sat in a room on your own going well that's feeling quite uncomfortable socially so we just think you need to approach that with a little bit of kindness to avoid that complete sudden jolt back into into their real world their real room so obviously thank people for taking part, um, make some friendly remarks to them about enjoying the sun or hope they can take a break now to stretch their legs or something that's engaging with them in a friendly way that you are looking forward to them again. I am going to end the meeting in uh, just one minute from now. Uh, so if you want to leave the meeting now, please do. And then they're leaving the meeting. You're not suddenly just shutting them all off and pinging them all, being thrown back into their own space. And then after the meeting, so we've only got a couple of slides on this. Um, for, for larger meetings again invite feedback so we're inviting feedback about the comfort of the meeting you know did it go at a comfortable pace is the length okay was the number of breaks right you know how do we find the use of technology so that if we are meeting with those people again we can 
support and improve on those things. Um, we also then talk about, so that's the people side of it, if you like, and then this is the, the task side, the content side. So, you know, was that well structured for you? Did you feel heard? Was it worthwhile? Um, and then, of course, you need to do your usual follow up meeting things. So circulating notes, implementing agreed actions and keeping up momentum, keep letting people know where you've got to and whatever was agreed in the meeting. But that's just any meeting protocol. Forget online or face to face. It's just what you should do. And then um, keep learning. So as a, um, use your small team or friends, uh, internal meetings to learn and practice and try new things. And once you've got more confidence, uh, if your platform enables these things, then start trying to use, use the tools that you would have used in face-to-face. -face. You maybe had a whiteboard or a flip chart stand in your face-to-face -face meeting. So start working out how you can use them. Use breakout functions if those are available. Do live note taking so people can see the notes being taken in front of them, which can give comfort that they genuinely are being heard and try out other tools and we're now blending I mean, we're, we're doing much more complex kind of facilitation but we're blending a lot of different tools now to make um do what we normally used to do face to face in deliberative workshops um online so in summing up prepare well think about the task think about the people side and experiment and if you do need help with something much more complex tense multi-stakeholder whether that's in to negotiate and agree something about the environment or whether it's something about sharing and developing new research practice that's our normal bread and butter so do please contact us because like i said we we really want to keep going too so um on to the last round for questions hi diana um i've been trying to send a few answers on the uh, q a box as well so i'm hoping uh, a few that i sent off have given you some answers or guidance if that helps um Let's have a look. I can see that uh, we've got a question that's coming in via the chat. Um, are online, this is from Kira Flynn, are online meetings better socially than phone conference? Thoughts on that, Diana? I think um, if you mean being able to see people by video, being able to see people better than just a phone, then I would say yes. Because for sure that we do miss out on some of our body language and they reckon that about 80% of body language 80% of communication is our body language well you remove all of that just by um, audio um, you remove some of it by face-to-face -face video but not all of it you can still see people's facial expressions and um, put that with their tone of voice and you can maybe understand what they're saying in a richer way I heard last week about somebody who utterly offended a huge group of people online because they um, it was an international thing and they said something in sort of very dry British sarky kind of humor and in face to face they'd have got away with it because they would have shrugged or pulled a silly sort of I don't know bit of body language and everybody would have known they were being funny uh, and that app did not come across at all and they managed to offend dozens of people so I think yes our, our preference is that you you have um, the audio uh, platform for use for meetings um let's have a look see what else there's quite a few questions specifically about a platform so as i say i'll try and answer those from our experience um at some point after all typed that's okay with uh with Saeed. uh Sarah Holman's asking, during a team meeting where everyone knows each other well, what is the best way to avoid the situation whereby more than one person starts talking at the same time? This seems to happen a lot. Um, I guess my feeling is if it's a small enough group, because in our own team meetings, which we haven't all structured and beautifully designed and done all the things we're suggesting now. So when it's just the five of us meeting the Dialogue Matters team, um, you know of course that happens because we're trying to conduct our, ourselves in a no, in a more normal flow and um so that does happen and then we just have you know defer to each other whoever and then on it goes um i think in larger meetings then then it is it is that you are the host and i and, and letting people know in advance you know i will come to you in batches and invite your contribution at that time uh, and do it in the two three four thing um, and then I think you're less likely to get it because it's certainly true that if several people respond at once, you hear none of them because the the um, technology is trying to key into who's talking and then it, it, it mutes everybody. So um, so that would be our thoughts at this time. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, I think let's have a look and see if there's anything else answered. Some people asking if there's the presentation is going to be available afterwards. Yes, it will. Um, yeah, just to, just to add to that, Ross. So I am, um, although I'm um, licensed to be a de bono facilitator, I'm not to be a, a de bono trainer. So the one bit that I have to take out is the six hat slides and, okay. and all of that bit about parallel thinking. So we will, it will be a slightly amended version of this. And we also think we've accidentally downloaded some pictures that might have been copyright. <laughs> so, so we just need to make sure we're not breaching okay, copyright. Uh, yeah, we need to check yeah, that. we'll double check them. Uh, but otherwise, yes, the presentation. And also just to say that um, this presentation is actually based on uh, some guidelines, some guidance that we put together for initially for the CEOs of the Wildlife Trust and then uh, sending out to anybody who wants them. And um, I've agreed with Sayin that after this, um, that can be sent to you or the link to that on our website or the actual document. And that's got some additional resources at the back of it, like it's got a, a survey post meeting sort of feedback form and it's got um, some of the body language, sort of international conventions around body language, um, signing on... Um, video platforms and things like that so that 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 resource will be available to you too excellent uh probably time for one more question unless anything else pops up uh nicola rivers was asked was making a comment perhaps she'd like to know more about how we maintain the group health um that as you talked about diana so i don't know if you want to give a brief response to that or whether it's perhaps a topic for another time yeah i think <laughs> I, I think in truth it's it's um so inherent to working as a facilitator that sometimes it's quite hard to make what we actually do and how we think explicit um it's just sort of part of our tacit knowledge but it's um i think it's about i think if you even just hold the value or the ethic that you if you are having meetings you want to make this yes achieve whatever the meeting is there to achieve and do that in the most effective an engaging way but are the people involved are is this being inclusive are different types of personality so that the sort of quiet deep thinkers and the sort of loud extrovert types are both of those people being able to engage in a way that's comfortable for them are you factoring in different ac accessibility needs you know if you're working across cultures or language barriers you know what accommodation do you need to make for that online so i think it's just if you hold that ethic and you think who am I engaging with and how can I make this for them a really worthwhile experience where that builds that trust in us, our organization, our reputation, how and, and their comfort and their willingness to engage with this in an ongoing way. How can I do that? Then I think actually you'll start finding all sorts of small innovations and things and maybe some that we haven't come up with. And if you do, please, please let us know. Um, so uh, I just think it's holding that ethic and then considering everything you do from that lens, from that perspective, and I think that would help you. Okay. I think that's probably it. Let's just is that our hour up? Look. It is our hour up. Just over. So, back to Saeem. Thank you both very much um, for such an informative webinar. Um, I think we can all take a lot of techniques from that to help us the future meetings and uh, we've already had some really positive comments come in from attendees um so yeah excellent webinar really informative um very practical and a reminder of the simple things we can forget to do that will make the event run smoothly um so yeah i think they've said it all it's been really great to have everyone join us today and like diana and ross said we'll be sharing presentation with you and guidance notes guidance notes uh, so I will send that across in due course. Um, yeah, so I think that's everything. Anything to add from you both? Um, I think um, I, I think I'd just like to finish that. I'm presuming there's a lot of environmentalists on this. I know there are some people who aren't, but I just actually want to really speak deeply from my heart at the moment. I know that sounds a bit American emotional, but actually we are in such a traumatic time all of us but from our experience as facilitators over 20 years working in some of the most tense and difficult situations so we've worked around fisheries and i don't know 
the Badger Cull and Bovine TB and, and all sorts of really, really tough, tough topics. And in the difficulty and the trauma and the upset that goes on around that, actually can birth the most exciting new innovations, new momentum and, and new sort of enthusiasm and collaborations. And I just think, I just want to speak to environmentalists and say, we've really, really got to seize this moment because what comes out of this is going to make completely the difference about whether we avert from the climate and nature disaster we're heading from or not. This is sort of like a such a disruption and out of disruption comes incredible new opportunities but you can be sure that the bad guys will be looking for those opportunities too and know this know this that disruption presents new opportunities so so i just i just wanted to finish on that actually is a sort of let, let's hang in there and let's keep our courage and let's keep going as best we can in this context thank you that's brilliant diana i could not have said that better myself so i think i think we'll leave it on that note thank you very much um and thank you everyone for joining us we hope that you, we hope to see you virtually uh, at future same webinars thanks very much bye thank All you right. thank you both bye bye, bye.